That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, God bless City Church. How are you guys doing on a Sunday morning? So good, so good. Uh, well, uh, this, I got a few things to tell you up front, and then we'll get into the content here in just a minute. Uh, but I woke up this morning, my voice is a little bit on the, like the laryngitis side, and it's the year 2023, so there's no more normal sickness left in the world. So I'm staying on the stage today, I'm staying backstage today, so the, the staff, the team are going to be handling baptisms if they happen after the service. Tim's going to be uh, greeting you all as you're leaving today. Uh, I'm just going to keep my space today, so just letting you know that up front. Uh, we made this video um, this past week, just to let you all know, for the next three months, now to the end of February, we as a staff, I mean, we're, we're going all in to try to grow volunteerism here at Agape City Church. Um, I'm just going to give you some information. This is not a sales pitch. I'm not trying to coerce anybody. I'm trying to give you actual information. Um, it takes about 70 people, 7-0, seven uh, to set this all up and execute services and tear this all down uh, between the two services we do on a Sunday morning. Since the beginning of Agape City Church, about a year and a half, it's been about the same 70 people have been doing those roles. And I'm just going to be honest with you, um, they're tired. They're getting tired. And we're going into a second winter. And so we really want to come to the congregation and say, hey, I know you've been, you know, sitting here for a while. You've been, you know, learning about Agape City Church, learning, deciding if you're, you know, do you trust us? Do you want to be a part of this family or not? And I'm just here to say, if you're in a place where you're like, I love this community, I love this church, um, and I'm ready to, you know, take a one step closer to get to know more people and to help execute, make this happen, we would love to have you on the team. Actually, I'm going to say this. We need two kind of groups of people. Absolutely we'll use warm bodies, okay? We have, if you're just like, I, I just want to show up and just like push a button, like we will, we will use warm bodies if that's what, you know, the margin that you have in your life with your full-time job and families and everything. Absolutely, that'd be great. But I'm, we could also use leaders. And just, some of you are competent men and women. You're inspirational. You're organized. You lead things, and it's not a burden to you to do so. And I'm just asking, if you have the gift of leadership, would you consider using that in your church congregation and leading a team or leading one of these areas? Uh, we would love to use that uh, gifting going into this next year. And I know the number one thing I, 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 I come into contact with, I'm like, hey, would you think about serving? People are like, ah, because if I start serving, I'll never be able to stop. Right, and, and, and we're not trying to make you serve for the rest of your life. Many hands make for light effort. We would love everybody to have seasons of serving and let someone else have an opportunity to serve as well. We want to share that. But I'm just telling you, for the last year, it's been the same 70. So tag, you're in. Okay. Uh, but we are here today, uh, we're in the third week of the series that we have called Reflections. And up to this point, what we've been talking about this whole month of November is how we see ourselves. If you came here on the first weekend, you know Tim did an awesome job, and he, and he kicked off the whole series looking through the book of James, and, and, and really just asking, you know, when you look into the Word of God, the Word of God should be a reflection back to you. And, and are you seeing yourself as Jesus sees you, or are, do you look different? And when you look different, who needs to change? Last week, if you were here, I challenged you to test yourself. Test yourself on your knowledge of Scripture. Test yourself on your, your own spiritual growth and maturity so you know where you are. You know, so don't stay a white belt Christian your whole life. You need to go to blue and purple and brown. And You should be maturing, not just getting older. You should be getting more mature in your faith as well. And only you know where you are and you know the, where you need to go in your spiritual walk. And so that's what we've been talking about up to this, phone, uh, up this point with this topic of reflections. Today I want to talk about something a little bit different, uh, but I think it's important. Because there's different ways that we see ourselves. There's, you know, there's reflections, there's pictures. Um, but another way we see ourselves, I believe, is we see ourselves in technology. In particular, what I want to talk about for my time today is I want to talk about that black mirror that you hold in your hand all day long called your smartphone. You look at this smartphone all the time. And this smartphone is reflecting back to you who you are. And in some degrees, it's programming who you're becoming. And so I want to talk about this in a biblical way. And I get it. You're like, Brad, biblical way to talk about smartphones? That doesn't even make sense, you know? And stick with me. And hopefully by the end of this uh, time we have together, um, you'll see that this matters to God. And this idea of what smartphones do, it's not something that's just new to smartphones, but it's something that's been enhanced by smartphones. But scripture does talk about what we can use as we engage with this to help set us on the right path. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But first, let me just set the, 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 the scene here, because here's what I know is true. What I know is true is that smartphones play a huge part in every single one of our lives. They play a huge part in all of our lives. People, people love their smartphones, love them. I know this because I drive on the interstate in our community, Okay. <laughs> And, and I'm not talking about people in cars on their smartphone. No, no, no. I mean, that's, that's one issue, right? No, no, no. I'm talking about you motorcycle people. I don't understand. Somebody explain to me. Because I pass motorcycle after motorcycle after motorcycle. And people will either, like, have their smartphone, like, on their hip in this giant, like, otter box, you know, thing. Or it's, like, or it's clipped to the top of their bike and it's all, like, in this box case kind of thing. And they're driving down the road in a motorcycle. Their phone is right there in a big old otter box case. And they're not even wearing a helmet. People are like, well, my phone's not backed up. Yeah, neither's this, Okay. People love their phones more than they do their own skull. People, we love our phones. In fact, um, look some of the stats on it. Globally, you should be aware of this. Globally, in the last seven years, the global population has grown by like a billion people. So we've, you know, we went from like seven billion to eight billion in the last seven years globally. Smartphone usage has gone up exponentially faster than that. In fact, in the last seven years, it used to be 3.6 billion people in the globe had smartphones. Now it's 6.9. Out of the 8 billion people on planet Earth, 7 billion of them use smartphones. And I know what you're thinking, like, the whole world? No way. About a decade ago, 2013, I had the opportunity to go to Haiti. And you would think Haiti, a third world country, and, 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 and you, know, there's, you know, there's not a lot of running water. And there's, like, there's all kinds of issues there. You would think they would not have this issue. They do. In Haiti, even in Haiti, a lot of the, 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 the young kids there, uh, the teenagers, they would have two smartphones. They would have one that works on one side of the, of the island, and one would work on the other side of the mountains. And, and, and they would, and so many people interact through smartphones. It is here to stay. It is changing culture. And you need to realize that. Smartphones are absolutely changing culture. When you think about, uh, I mean, some of us are in this room. We're, we're, we're uh, wise enough. We're old enough, right? We remember life before smartphones. And what's true is, uh, if you were born in the 1900s, <laughs> that sounds weird. If you were born in the 1900s, your life wasn't that different than your grandparents or even your great-grandparents. I mean, maybe like, you know, we had color TV and they had radios or maybe we had cars and they had like horse and carriage or something like that. So like there were changes, absolutely. But the way human beings interacted, the role of par- roles of parents in people's lives really did not change all that much. Communication, traditions, information for, for centuries relatively operated the same way. Like, like you know, for, for the longest time, if, if a child wanted to learn how to do something, they would have to find somebody with that information, and that person would have to teach them how to do it. You know, a child would need a, a parent to teach them how to change the oil, the parent to teach them how to, you know, bake a ham or whatever it is, right? That's not the world we live in anymore. My daughters, if they want to learn how to change the oil of the car, they don't ask dad anymore. Not just because I don't know how, but they, they don't ask me. <laughs> There's a plug, right? Anyway, all right. They don't ask me because they no longer need information. If my daughters want to learn how to change the oil, bake a ham, do a, you know, a, a back layout flip, they don't ask their parents anymore. They Google it or they go on YouTube and they find a tutorial video of how to do it. And with that information, they start doing it. The role of a parent in 2023 is different. We are no longer here to give information. All the information in the world is in the palm of their hands. So we're no longer informers. I would suggest we're curators. We're, our role now is to point young men and women to good information, to true information. Because not everything that comes across your screen is true or accurate or beneficial. In fact, that's the first thing I think is the problem with smartphones. I think a huge problem with smartphones that we have to address and we have to acknowledge as an issue is why do we interact with them so much anyway? And, 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 the, and, the, and the stats are in. We are off the charts with how much we interact with our smartphones. In fact, in, in, in America, the average person in America is on their smartphone five to six hours a day. 
five to six hours a day. Do this. You know, don't do it right now, but when you get home, or if you, have, if you have a smartphone, open up your phone. Go to your settings. If you're in the iPhone, go to your screen time app. If you're in an Android, I have no idea how to help you. But, <laughs> but I know the feature's there because Android always has the feature first, and the iPhone just copies it later. Okay, so anyway, so just go in your settings. Go to your screen time. Look how many hours on an average day you spend on your phone. I would love to stand here as your lead pastor and be like, I'm only on it for two hours a day. That's not true. (laughs) I did this this morning, and I just looked at yesterday. And yesterday, I was on my smartphone over six hours, six hours plus. Now, I was listening to a lot of audio books. I don't need your judgment. Calm down, okay? But... (laughs) But, but think about this is This is a huge part of our lives. We're on this thing for hours a day. Now, we're not all mindlessly scrolling for hours. Sometimes you're listening to a podcast, listening to an audio book. I don't listen to the radio in my car anymore. I have a Bluetooth feature, and I just listen to music on my playlist. So, so though, though at that time, it's not just you staring at the screen, but we have to be honest that we are spending an exu- exorbitant amount of time on our screens, and we have to realize that this is an issue. Why do we do it? I believe it's because we're looking for distraction. I think human beings want to be distracted. And it's a problem. I mean, it's it's so much of a problem that like our state, the state of Michigan, had to pass a law to keep people from distracted driving, right? We had to pass a law to keep people off their phone. And and, and whenever you're driving, just just look to your left and your right because it's not working. (laughs) Pull up to a red light. I can't tell you how many people at a red light are just head down, just in their phones. I see it all the time. And, and, and can I just say this? I don't understand why being on your phone is considered distracted driving, but this is not considered distracted driving. <laughs> I see this just as much as I see people on their cell phones. Can we outlaw this? Anyway, all right. But we, I, I believe distraction is a problem in our culture. And it's not just distracted driving, which is very unsafe. Please don't do that. But, it, but you know what breaks my heart? is when I see distracted parenting. I see families in restaurants together, every single member on a phone scrolling and no one interacting with one another. I see parents at sporting events while their children are, are trying to achieve something and learn a skill and they're just, and just scrolling on their screen and yeah, yeah, that's nice and not even paying attention to their child. I see parents who are on the screen and their, and their children are talking to them. And maybe they even engage verbally, but they don't make eye contact with their children. And I think this is a huge issue. Eye contact is so important to human beings. Facial recognition is so important that we're seeing one another as we're communicating and talking. And when we're staring at a phone and we're talking to one another, no wonder a whole generation is having problems connecting with people looking eye to eye. I don't think this majority of this number of people are, are, are having an issue. I think they're being trained that eye contact isn't as important in society anymore, but it is. And so I want us to be intentional and that we're not just going into distraction for distraction's sake, and particularly with the time that we have for our children, that we're not letting distraction rob us of the time that we need to lead, to grow, and to parent these children. So distracted parenting is an issue, and I also see so many followers of Jesus who just distract their life away. I see people who who want to distract from the responsibilities of their life or want to uh, distract from maybe the the decisions they've made and and where they are in life that they don't like. I see people who want to distract from the reality that death is the fate of every human being. So rather than considering my own mortality, I just want to just scroll content so my brain is never idle enough to even contemplate that one day I am going to die, and what do I need to accomplish on this earth before that day comes? I know people who don't even want to be left alone with their own thoughts. They want to be distracted at all times. I believe this is an issue, and I believe we have to realize that that distraction is, is, is not optimal for us. God calls us to be alert, to be aware, and there's a reason for that. The scriptures I have for you today, they're kind of, kind of be all over the, the, the Bible here. So if you're taking notes, it's going to be a, a good Sunday for you to take notes. So you can go back and look at these scriptures later. But 
I'm going to go uh, a few scriptures in the New Testament just to let you know why this is an issue. The Apostle Peter, in his epistle later in his life, uh, in 1 Peter, he writes about the need to, for us to be uh, alert. And this is what he says in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says this, be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Agape City, I come here each week to tell you the truth. And the truth is this. God is real. He is real. He is for you. He loves you. But I'm telling you, the other truth is this. So is the Satan. The accuser is real. The devil is real. And he wants to do anything he can do to get you from focusing on God. He is happy to do it. And if the devil can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy. Because he doesn't need you to worship him. He just needs you to not worship God. And what Peter says here is that you and I need to be alert. We need to be aware of that. And when we're walking around, we need to have sober minds. And that's what I would suggest. I, I think some of our addiction to our technology and our smartphones, it's the exact same as maybe addiction to, to, to pills or an addiction to a substance. I think it's the exact same. Because when you go to a bottle, whether it's you know, pills or uh, alcohol or whatever is in there, so what we're looking for is to numb out. You're looking for distraction. You're looking to shut your brain off with these substances. I believe we're doing the same thing with content. I just want to numb out. I just want to shut my brain down. But God says, you need to be alert and you need to be sober because we have an enemy who's going to try to lie to you, tempt you, and lure you away from God. He has no power. He can't pull you away. He can't force you away. All he can do is tempt you away and you would make the choice to willingly follow or not. And I believe we have to be aware and awake and alert because we do have opposition in this world. So I think we need to be more intentional with how we live. So I know distraction is what we want, but, but, but I think we can't just go headlong into it. So how do we address it? And I know you're thinking, like, well, what is the Bible going to say about smartphones? Because it's 2023, and the Bible was written like thousands of years ago, and there's no technology, and there's nothing in the Bible about how to address this. I would differ with you. I think there is a solution for all of this in Scripture. And the solution lies in self-control. Self-control. Let me ask you this. When it comes to your relationship with your phone, who's in control? And you don't have to answer it to me. You don't have to answer it out loud. But you should really be honest with yourself. When it comes to your relationship with your smartphone, who is in control? Let me give you a test. Here's a metric, okay? When you go to bed at night, do you put your phone to bed or does your phone put you to bed? Who's in control? Do you choose how much time you spend on your phone or does your phone choose how much time it lures you into it? Who's in control? Self-control, I believe, matters to God. And where there is not self-control, I believe people are in peril. They're in danger. This is not my opinion. This is in Scripture. Let me give you a couple of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, there's these two Proverbs that just talk about the importance of self-control. And, and, and the idea of self-control is not just, you know, the, you know, the being good. It's, 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 it's being strong. I love Proverbs 16, 32. It says, better is a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. We love to watch movies with conquerors and whatever, but he says, no, no, better is a self-controlled person than a conqueror. If you can control yourself, you're strong. I love Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through, uh, broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Without self-control, you don't have defenses. Satan and the devils and the demons that he has, they get into your life. They tempt you. They, they can just come and go as they please if you do not have protection around you. And if you don't have self-control, you just, you just go with the flow with whatever culture is doing, whatever society is doing. If you lack all self-control, I'm telling you, Satan is going to get in there and start playing, and it's not going to be fun. Self-control matters to God. And when people don't have a relationship with God, I see this time and time again, they lack self-control. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the, the letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi. So in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, this is what the Apostle Paul says about self-control. Uh, he says this. <clears throat> he says, for as I 
have often told you before and now tell you again with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. It breaks my heart. There's people who are living as enemies to God. And look what those, those type of people do. Their destiny is destruction. And look what it says. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. And their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we, are e- and we eagerly await our Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, it says when people don't have God... Th- then they're going to allow something else to lead their life. And it says that their God is their stomach. And what Paul is saying, he's not saying like this, this sack of acid is your God. Is that what he's talking about, your stomach, the organ? He's saying your appetite, your desire will become your deity. You will just give in to what you want. And, and sometimes that's not to our benefit. I'm raising two young girls in this world. If I allowed them to have whatever they wanted for dinner every single night, it would just be Kool-Aid and candy and hot dogs nonstop. But that's, I know that's not going to, their appetite is not right. They never have an appetite for broccoli, but they need it sometimes. And so they need me as a parent to give them some self-control. Eat the broccoli. <laughs> You're adults. You're adults. And when you just live by your appetite, is, is that the best thing for you? Maybe you're scrolling Kool-Aid and candy all day long, literally affecting your mind, changing your mind, and to the point where now you crave this more and more, and before you know it, you're in full-blown addiction because you allowed your stomach to be your God. I believe followers of Jesus need to be men and women of self-control. And self-control is the key. I don't control you. I don't go home with you. I don't look at your browser history. I don't count your drinks. I'm not here to control you. I'm here to care for you and tell you some truth. It is for you to control yourself. Now, when I say that, Right now, and sitting in this room, we're probably inspired. Like, yeah, I should do a better job. I should, I should get home, and I, I should control myself better. And that's what we tell ourselves. And then the question I'm going to turn around and ask you then is, what are you going to do? How? How are you going to do that? If you're going to leave here and you're going to be under more self-control, how are you going to do that? And the average person was like, well, I'm just going to try real hard. I'm just going to just lean into willpower. I'm just I'm not going to do it anymore. Let me tell you some truth of Scripture. Your willpower will never be enough. Your willpower will eventually wear out. It does for all of us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what I know about human beings is this, even if you resist a sin for a week, you have no idea how great that temptation is gonna be in a month. To live a life completely without sin and to resist all temptations, it's just, I don't know that it even happens in this lifetime. It's not that we, it doesn't mean we should go headlong into sin, but, but I'm telling you, your willpower, it will wear out. I love the way the Apostle Paul writes this, because he warned us about this in, in, in the letter to, to the Colossians. He says this, Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says this, Since you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to this world, do you submit to its rules? Like, if you, if you live with Christ and Christ in you, why do you still act like the world whose their stomach is their God. Why do you act like them? And look what it says. So you tell yourself, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And these rules, which have, the, have to do with things that are, are destined to perish with us, are based on merely human commands and teachings. That's what we tell ourselves. Well, I'm just going to I'm going to drink less. I'm just, going to, I'm just not going to watch that anymore. I'm, just, I'm not going to pick up my phone as much. And we tell ourselves, like, I'm, I'm not going to do these things. And it sounds righteous, doesn't it? It sounds like it's the right thing to do. But what I love about the Paul is he keeps it real. It's like, that has the, the, the sound of wisdom, but it's actually foolishness. Look what he says the very next verse. He says this. Such regulations, the don't touch, don't taste, don't, don't pick up. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining, 
sensual indulgence, if it's a temptation to you, not touching it, not tasting it, not picking up willpower, it's only going to work for so long. And eventually it will wear out and you will give in to that temptation. So how do we get self-control if we, as human beings, are notoriously bad at self-control? I would suggest that self-control was never supposed to come from within us. It was supposed to be given to us. When I look at Galatians chapter 5 and, and, and I read about self-control, what I see in Galatians chapter 5 is that self-control is a gift from the Holy Spirit of God. In Galatians chapter 5 talks about these fruits, the, 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 what the Holy Spirit does when he's in us. And, and, and this is what it says in Galatians chapter 5 when it's explaining you know, what the Holy Spirit does. It says this, the fruit of the Spirit, the first thing it does, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Also, it's joy, it's peace, it's, it's forbearance, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness and gentleness. And look at that, and self-control. The Holy Spirit, he helps you. He helps you to discipline yourself, to control yourself. It's not your will. It's God's will in you that helps you not just resist sin. Literally, the Holy Spirit changes your taste buds where you don't even like the flavor of sin anymore. You don't think it's as fun as you used to. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't think it's as, you just, you're just almost get, become disgusted by it. Not, not judgmental, but like you're just like, I don't even want to do that anymore. When the Holy Spirit transforms you, you stop wanting to get as far away from God as possible, and you actually start to want to get closer to God. And it's not a burden. It's not rules. It's like it's beautiful, and it's love. And like when the Holy Spirit like changes your heart, it's, it, just, it changes your taste for sin. To where it's not willpower anymore. You're transformed. And that process is called sanctification. It's not a switch that you just flip on. It's a process of growth that you grow in as the Holy Spirit continues to work in your life. But I'm asking you, do you even have the Holy Spirit in you? Or are you all alone fighting temptation on your own will? And then people would ask me, well, how, do, how would I know? How would I know if I have the Holy Spirit? To that, I can only give you scripture. Acts chapter two, verse 38 says that you and I should repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins and we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I know for certain, if you profess Christ as Lord and you are baptized into the name of Jesus, I know for certain you have the Holy Spirit. And I know the Holy Spirit in you is who will transform you and he will give you the fruit of self-control. It's a gift from him. And I think that, that we need to lean into that and stop, worrying, stop living on our own willpower, but allow the Holy Spirit to, to work in us. And when we do this, then we see that it's, what God is doing in us is transforming us to become fully like Christ. In, in first, uh, Second Peter, um, Peter like, gives a whole list of like, what this process looks like. And I love the way he writes it because this process, I, 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 this makes sense to me. And I'm like, I could do this. I can know exactly where I am in this process. And I can know what, my, my, you know, what the next step is in my journey for spiritual maturity and growth. Apostle Peter says this. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. So first off, it starts with faith. Believing that God is real. That's the first thing you have to get to is the point where you believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of the living God and you have faith in him as your savior. And when you have that faith, the very first step is then just try to be good. Would you try to be good? At least have a desire to be good. You know, and that's the first step. Just like, I don't want to be hurt people. I don't want to be gossip about people. I don't want to tear people down. I want to build people up. I want to love people. I have an intrinsic, intrinsic desire to be good. So because when goodness is in you, then, then, you just, with that goodness, that, that, that desire to do good, add some knowledge. Don't just do good that you think is good. Do good that you know is good. To love your neighbor as yourself, to forgive your enemy, to bless those who persecute you, to consider it pure joy when you face any trials. With your desire to be good, would you add knowledge to that? So you're not just guessing in your actions, you're doing what Jesus has asked you to do. And with that desire to be good and that knowledge now that you're, you're trying to do it, then control yourself. Say, so, yeah, I know I, I want to indulge in this, but, but, script, but I want to be good. And, and the scripture says that that's not good. So I'm going to control myself and not do that. 
because I want to be good, and I know it's not good because Scripture said that. And then you start, that's self-control. That's you not just letting your stomach lead your life, but you let the will of God in you lead your life. And what I love is that self-control then grows into perseverance. Because when you start living like that, people are going to be like, what are you doing? When you start living like that, people are like, oh, you think you're better than me? I don't. I'm just trying to do something different than you. When you start living like that, you know, it's going to be difficult for you, but, but, but don't give it up. Persevere through that. You know, because when you persevere, then you start to look like God. That's when you stop looking like everybody else in this world and you look like the kingdom of God. You look like Jesus in the way that you love, in the way that you, you're, you're patient, in the way that you're kind, and you start to have godliness. And when that godliness is available to you, that's when mutual affection happens. That's when you stop seeing people as competition or stop seeing people as, you know, like, they're taking, and you start to love, like, genuinely see people as your brothers or sisters and, and, or, 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 or sinners in need of a savior, and, and, and you have this mutual affection for people. You don't even care if they like Ohio State. You're like, but Jesus loves you too. You have mutual affection. And then that kind of mutual affection, that is what leads to agape. That is what leads to unconditional love. You don't just flip on unconditional love. You grow into it. Faith in God, desire to be good. Use knowledge with that desire to be good. Control yourself. Persevere in that control. Drill it. Work it. Keep doing it over and over because then you're going to look like God, have true mutual affection, and you will be men and women of love. Not the feeling of love. True, biblical, unconditional love. And love conquers fear. Love covers a multitude of sins. And I'm telling you, love will set you free. But you have to lean in to the early steps to grow into it. It doesn't happen overnight. And my concern is that we are not controlling ourselves. These cell phones are controlling us, and they're programming us away from God. So here's my question for you, or my challenge to you. It's this. Let's take back control. And rather than looking at our cell phone as the perfect device for distraction, why don't we realize that in this cell phone, we have an opportunity to heighten our discipleship. What if you, you, controlled your phone and you told your phone, you no longer waste my time being idle, you now enrich my faith. And that's now what I'm gonna make you do, phone. I'm gonna make you enrich my faith. The average person picks up their cell phone 75 to 100 times a day. Isn't that wild? Picks it up 75 to 100 times a day. That's why I say, that's why I say, I say cell phones are the new cigarettes. I, I, I believe this. Cell phones are the new cigarettes. If you like watch movies or whatever about like in like the 50s or 60s, it felt like everybody smoked, right? In the 50s and 60s. And like, you know, if you were a greaser, you had like the pack of cigarettes like rolled up in your, your shirt sleeve. Or if you're like a sophisticated, you know, person, you have like the, the little silver case and you like tap in your cigarette, like, mm -hmm, you know? The ladies had like their little trombone smokes, you know, like whatever. Like, like it felt like everybody smoked in the 50s and 60s, right? And why did they smoke? They didn't have anything else to do. If they were a group of people and they didn't know what to do, well, I'll just light up a cigarette and look cool. You know, like it, was like, it was just a time killer. It was just something that people did. I think that's what we're still doing today, but I think we've switched from cigarettes to we've switched over to phones. We'll be sitting in a room full of people and we're like, I don't really know anybody. I'm just looking at my phone. No, nope, nothing there. All right. Two minutes goes by. Well, I better look again just in case something happened. <laughs> nope. Okay. Put it down. You know. Four minutes go by. Let me just look one more time just in case something might have happened. And we just pick up our phone like we're picking up cigarettes. Some of you are chain flippers, you know, like <laughs> 90 times a day, 90 times a day, that's over 10 times an hour. What are you looking at over 10 times? What do you need to look at more than 10, every 10 minutes? What are we looking at? Oh, Val Kilmer was in Willow. That's crazy. You know, like, like what? why are we going back to this so much? Because it's distraction. It's distraction. It's distraction. What if we forced our phone to disciple us? And I don't know what that looks like for you. I, I, I mean, I'll let you interact with that the way that you, that you want to. Um, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this, okay? Let me confess something to you, all right? I have never, not once, ever in my life bought or intentionally played a Taylor Swift song. 
Never. But why do I know the lyrics to like eight Taylor Swift songs? <laughs> if you could only see that I'm the one who understands you, been here all along, why can't you see you belong to? You know it too. You know it too. I have never bought or intentionally listened to a Taylor Swift song once in my life. Why do I know those lyrics? Because I hear them a thousand times a day. They come on the radio. They're on commercials. It, 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 it's playing in the, and I'm shopping in the store. It just, it just comes into my life. I'm not, I don't even want it. It just happens. Okay. Again, what if we took control of our phone? If I'm picking up my phone 75 to 100 times a day, okay. What if... I, I sabotage Satan, and he wants me to look at my phone for distraction and just to numb out. What if I put on my lock screen a scripture, a scripture that matters to me, a scripture that I'm actually trying to memorize, a scripture that I'm actually trying to do and live out in my life? And what if every time I pick up my phone, before I just mindlessly slip by that lock screen, I have to read that scripture and the reference? Religion, our Father, accepts his pure as look after orphans and widows in their distress. And then go in and do whatever riffraff you're going to do. Ten minutes goes by, oh, religion, our Father accepts us pure as look after orphans and widows in there. Okay. Do you know how many scriptures you would memorize in a week? They would just be ingrained in you just because of the repetition of it. See, I'm not saying smartphones are evil. I'm saying you need to be intentional. And you need to realize that these smartphones, if you don't disciple them, if, if, you, don't, if, if you don't use them to disciple you in the Lord, they're going to disciple you away from God. That's what they're going to do. There's a book, if you love reading, you can read these books. If you don't like reading, you can throw it away. It's not even a Christian book, you should know that. Um, it's a book called The Power of Habit. This book is prolific because you need to realize so much of what you do in the United States of America, it's not even what you, what you want to do. It's what you've been conditioned to do by society, by culture, and we're losing this battle. And I know what you're thinking, like, oh, Brad, you know, marketing doesn't work, commercial doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work the first time. But when you go by an ad six, seven, eight, nine, twenty, a hundred times, then all of a sudden you start buying things off the Instagram store. Because it does work. And so you need to realize this, this all these devices, you know, all the, the all this stuff, it's gamed against you. You have to take agency of your life back and stop just going on autopilot through this world, because this world's gonna lead you to destruction. You gotta wake up and be intentional with your faith and take control back to your life. So let me give you some resources real quick. I just wanna give you these resources on your smartphone. Here's some good apps. If you wanna turn your phone into a discipleship tool, then, then I'm not saying you have to interact with it necessarily less, but maybe you just need to interact with it differently. And maybe you need to force your cell phone to disciple you. So this, the apps that I go to on the regular on my phone uh, are the YouVersion Bible app. You can use any Bible app you want. I, I like the YouVersion one. There's all kinds of reading plans in it. And let me, if you're taking notes, you should write this down. Every year, I do the Robert Roberts reading plan. So on January 1, I start the Robert Roberts reading plan, and I read through the Old Testament of the Bible once and the New Testament twice in that year. I've been doing this for about 10 years. So I've read the Bible cover to cover, every single word, for 10 times minimum. And I know that. Do you know if you've ever read the Bible cover to cover? Do you know what's in Scripture? Maybe starting that plan might help you. I put our church app up there, and that's not like marketing. That's not like, oh, can you please give us some more clicks? No, I don't care about that. The Bible app's going to give you the truth of God's word. Our church app lets you know what's going on in our community. And if nothing else, if nothing else on the app, would you please commit to at least once a week opening it and looking at the prayer requests. I just saw one just before I walk on stage. A mom of a child with special needs is at her wit's end, and she just needs support and help and how to love her child and, 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 and the situation that they're in. We have so many people in our congregation who are fighting cancer. We have so many people who, are, who their jobs are on rocky ground right now. And they're asking you, they're asking their church to pray for them. Would you please open those apps and would you pray with them? Because it's not positive thoughts, it's not good vibes. We are asking our Heavenly Father to bless our brother or sister who worships with us and say, God, would you glorify yourself through this situation? 
Blue Letter Bible, this is a, if you, if you want to study scripture, not just read it, you want to study scripture, this is beautiful. Because Blue Letter Bible, uh, um, it helps you understand the original language, the Greek and the Hebrew. Because I, I don't, okay, don't tell anybody this, okay? I don't know Greek. <laughs> but Brad, sometimes you come out here and you say the Greek root, the word is this. I know, I know, I just, I Googled it, like right before I came out here. Blue Letter Bible is a great resource where it has the original Hebrew and the original Greek and then the English words that they get translated to, and it helps you see the Bible in its original language. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek. Uh, that information is available to you. And then finally, I'll give you another app, the Bible Project. And the Bible Project is uh, a man named Tim Mackey and his team, and, and Tim, will, he refers to himself as a, a Bible nerd. He has a mug that says Bible nerd, and that's who he is, but he tries to take very complex topics of the Bible. He doesn't make them shallow, but he does make them simpler to understand. So if you want to grow in your knowledge of what each book of the Bible is about or the theology in the Bible, that is available to you as well. But I am saying this. The black mirror of our phone is always reflecting us back to us. And your phone is either going to disciple you closer to God or away from God. And your phone is amoral. Your phone's not evil. It's how you use it that matters. You are in control of that device in your hand. It does not control you. You choose, does that device take you further from God? Or maybe that's a tool that can help draw you closer to God. And let me give you one last scripture. And 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, on the idea of, of getting away from distraction and being alert, it says this. The end of all things is near. That's where I feel like we are in the year 2023. That's where people always come up and, Brad, what's going on in you know, Israel and Palestine and the wars? And is this world going to end? And people are concerned. Well, the truth is we've always been close to the end, ever since Jesus resurrected. And it says the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. Why? So you could pray. So you could pray. Agape City, I want us to be intentional as men and women who love God. I want us to be intentional with how we live our lives. And these phones, if we use them in a, in without any intentionality, they will distract us and they will lead us into, if nothing else, idleness at the minimum and full-blown evil in the maximum. But I believe if we can practice self-control and if we could value being alert and sober, I believe this tool that Satan would love to use to destroy you actually could enrich your faith and actually make you more effective for the kingdom of God. So this week, that's my challenge to you. What does it take for you to leave this place and be more intentional with how you interact with your black mirror?